exile. There's many a far horizon line, blue waters laced with foam, wild, lonely waste of sea and sky between me and my home. The pastures fond and far away, the daisies and the dew, the morning land of light and mist, those summers that I knew. The long green hours of grass and sun, the blue and peaceful air, are lost beyond the sky and sea, as if Anthony Jervis Moran was completely unknown and has only come to light as a result of the research done by independent Rosdan based academic Norbert Hux into the post career of noted 60s rogue psychiatrist Robert Bremen, who had an obscure association with Moran in late life. This story is a grim tale of woe, but also one of the most remarkable and extreme films ever made in Ireland. Had it been made, it would undoubtedly change the way Irish experimental cinema was regarded. Indeed, Huggs founded the story of Indeed, Huggs found the story of Moran so fascinating that he became distracted from his research into Bremen to concentrate on researching Moran instead. These are Huggs's notes pieced together. He was born in 1947. It is a he was born in 1947. It is possible that he was adopted, and he used to claim that he was the son of a priest who gave him up to a farming couple in the town of Plumhack, County Limerick. This was a horse breeding area, and he grew up working around horses. He was obsessed with American B movies, especially sci fi, and was a keen amateur boxer. He had to leave the country in a hurry after he and his girlfriend at the time tried to organize a failed kidnapping of a thoroughbred horse. Rumor has it that they wanted to hold the horse to ransom on the eve of it being sent to an important race and used the money to leave the country. There was an accident in the barn they were keeping the horse in and it was severely burned to the point that it had to be put down. The girlfriend refused to flee with him on the grounds of having ailing parents to look after. Less than a year later, she died in a gruesome farming accident that led to rumors of a retribution killing. He fled to London, penniless. He worked for a short time as a laborer before finding a more congenial job as a gardener and graveyard attendant, notably at the all but ruined Highgate Cemetery in the late 60s, when it was the center of occult rumor and activity. This allowed him time to think and read, which he did voraciously. He was, however, living in considerable poverty. His increasing engagement with cinema at the time is hard to document, although he wrote a review of a club event featuring Kenneth Anger and Pink Floyd for an underground magazine at this time, and seems to have had some contact with the London Filmmakers Co-op. He began working on an epic science fiction project about life on an Earth colonized by aliens. He seems to have described this to some as a comic book project and to some as a film. With the scope of it and the special effects that would have been required would have made it too expensive even for Hollywood. It had a dense plot and many esoteric asides and seems to have not got beyond the level of several densely written notebooks. He also started a free bit cinema called The Phoenix that specialized in art and experimental films mixed with repertory fare as a rival to and companion as a rival and companion venue to the electric on Portobello Road, but also mixing in horror and B-movie fare like another filmmaker on cinema, Anthony Balcher's JC in Piccadilly. However, The Phoenix was incompetently run and seemed mainly Moran's way of giving himself a good film education. Although his love of cinema was unquestionable. How it managed to stay open with its clientele of stoned weirdos and creeps, it's hard to know, but there's a strong rumor that it was also used for occult rituals, some of which Moran not only participated in, but also devised. 
It is also rumored that one of these private sessions got out of control, which is why it closed down. It is still further rumored that he was actually shooting scenes for his film, whether a version of the science fiction idea, a variation on it, or something else. And th that and that was what these bizarre goings on in the cinema really were. He left the country very suddenly, and one persistent rumor is that he was filming a ritual scene in his cinema that involved indecent or even sadistic acts involving a horse. He moved first briefly to Paris, then to New York, where he became obsessed with the idea of making this film by any means necessary. Although he seemed to have the highest artistic intentions for it, he was not well received in New York and ended up eking out a desperate existence, often in extreme poverty. He was a cameraman on a number of porn reels in the early 80s. He was cameraman on a number of porn reels in the early 80s, some of which he is rumored to have directed. This was apparently not only out of financial desperation, but to educate himself in zero-budget filmmaking when it at last became apparent that the large budget he dreamt of would never manifest. In the end, he again had to flee the country after becoming involved in a dubious plot to steal and resell a large amount of heroin to fund his film. We have a better sense of his ideas for his film at this time, thanks to his attempts to get the film financed, which led to him circulating proposals in the hope of getting financing, some of which are quite vividly remembered. Although he seldom, if ever, visited Ireland, he remained in close contact with many people either living there or frequently visiting, and closely followed the latest Irish news. He was obsessed with the idea of Ireland and was determined to return to make his film there. In fact, in the opinion of more than one person who knew him, he could have managed to make his film in New York if he had chosen to do so. It was his insistence on making it in Ireland that made the project impossible. Yet the details of his vision of Ireland were very personal, and some felt it had become a repository for all his paranoid feelings a dystopian fantasy country of his imagination. He had a story for his film, a scaled down and more hard-edged version of his earlier science fiction epic. It involved a slime-based alien entity that could exist as one creature, or be split into many, doing battle with evil priests for the control of the people and, specifically, control of human reproduction. The church also has a sideline in selling fallen women to horse feed manufacturers to be illegally ground up and put in a popular new variety. The church also has a sideline in selling fallen women to horse feed manufacturers to be illegally ground up and put in a popular new variety of horse feed. It turns out that this horse food has powerful narcotic properties and becomes the drug of choice for wealthy foreigners bring a great deal of money to Ireland by visiting to indulge. The aliens start selling it, but also become hooked on it. Rather than a straightforward narrative, this film was planned as a highly experimental work that would proceed through several styles, including minimalist structuralist deconstructions of the illusion of narrative as a drug in itself, and some passages of pure visual abstraction representing the world as pure blissful sensation before the arrival of the human race. There is a rumor that some sequences were shot in New York involving a well-known actor delivering a long monologue to a horse, but this footage has not survived, or never existed. But this footage has not survived, or it never existed. When he returned to Ireland, it was as a fugitive from the gangsters he had tried to steal from who were intending to kill him. He moved into a caravan and drifted around for several months, always trying to cover his tracks. Under unknown circumstances, he ended up moving into an abandoned farm in a very remote part of Kerry, with a sinister and obscure character known as Michael Brennan. Brennan lived under conditions Raman lived there under conditions of extreme self-imposed poverty, although he was said to be rich, with a girlfriend and another woman who might or might not have been his daughter. A gifted and highly qualified psychologist in the 60s, 
Bremen's researchers had veered toward the occult, and he dropped out of mainstream therapy. The source of much rumor and speculation, very little is known for sure about him, and his ultimate fate remains completely unknown. The woman he claimed as his daughter was found in the late 80s, wandering around the streets of Kenmare in a state of deep shock, and died eight months later without ever speaking again. It was rumored that Moran was working for Bremen, driving around the country for him. Perhaps dealing drugs, perhaps involved in work for more occult nature, or perhaps both. In any case, he was soon rumored to have bought a video camera. A man answering his description came to the attention of Gardy in Dublin as a mysterious figure, only seen at night, who was reportedly approaching heroin addicts and convincing them to play bizarre scenes for his camera in return for drugs. None of these tapes have ever surfaced, however, and no one has ever reported seeing one. He did show some tapes to visitors and contacts and film abroad, and in their own way they are reportedly as disturbing as the alleged addict videos. Endless shots wandering around Bremen's ruined farm, senselessly filming the buildings, and very occasionally catching sight of Bremen or one of the two women. Moran seemed to ascribe great artistic importance to this messy and pointless documentation, which caused some of Sora to doubt his sanity. None of these tapes have been found. In the winter of 1986, Moran's small van went over the edge of a steep narrow road overlooking the sea. He died in the accident. Only one tape remains. It was found in his caravan and is quite different from any description of the other material he was allegedly shooting at the time. Is it enough to convince us that had circumstances been otherwise, he could have made a major contribution to experimental film in Ireland? It improves heart health. Anything that gets the blood moving can be good for your heart. This doesn't mean that masturbating is equivalent to running a marathon and, because of this, you should think of it as a replacement for exercise. But it definitely can't hurt to enjoy as a supplement to your regular exercise routine. 2. It helps you sleep better at night. Some say masturbation is an all-natural sleep aid. If you sometimes have trouble sleeping, masturbating could help knock you out. 3. It reduces the risk of prostate cancer. 
Masturbation could potentially help ward off a deadly illness. Men who masturbate have a reduced risk of prostate cancer, presumably through flushing of toxins through ejaculation. 3. It strengthens your pelvic floor. There are many ways to work the pelvic floor. To strengthen your pelvic floor, you could try doing casual exercises. Or, you could just masturbate. 5. It reduces your risk of vaginal infection. The panting of the cervix that happens with orgasm is thought to reduce cervical infections and uterus in women. 6. It increases immune function. Masturbation may not replace vitamin C, but it can't hurt. Masturbation may help ward off the occasional cold or fever. Of course, even if you masturbate regularly, you'll still need to engage in other activities that strengthen your immune system, like getting sufficient rest. Still, it can't hurt. 7. It gives you the chance to enjoy truly safe sex. Masturbation is free of the awkward moments that can accompany partner sex. This, in turn, can greatly reduce stress both due to the ability to enjoy the pleasure of sex without strings attached and the hormones that are released during orgasm. 8. It can improve your confidence. Getting to know yourself can improve your confidence. Masturbation gives you the perfect opportunity to get to know your body and your sexual response. You can grow in your own sexual confidence and improve your self-image. 9. It can increase the enjoyment during partner sex. Masturbation can be used as a tool to improve your overall sex life. After all, if you have a general idea of what you like during solo sex,
Zero, we have ignition and liftoff from Cape Canaveral Air Station of the Air Force Delta II launch vehicle carrying the new GPS-2R satellite. We have had an anomaly. We need to secure the area. Once again, we had liftoff of Delta II launch vehicle from Cape Canaveral Air Station, and we just had a problem with the vehicle on the pad. with trees, princesses, prime ministers, derelict filling stations, more beautiful than the Taj Mahal, clouds and birds. I believe in the death of the emotions and the triumph of the imagination. I believe all excuses. I believe all reasons. I believe all hallucinations. I believe all anger. I believe all mythologies, memories, lies, fantasies, evasions. I believe in the mystery and melancholy of a hand, in the kindness of trees, in the wisdom of light.